most of what I'm going to talk about today is um, is a, a Plasmodium falciparum focused elimination campaign in Karen State that's in um, eastern eastern Myanmar. Um, but a few days ago, Tim mentioned that. Um, some of you guys might be more interested in hearing a bit about TB or maybe even COVID-19 as well. So I'd say this will probably be 70% malaria and then I'll split the, the, the last portion up into a, a bit about TB also from the Thai Myanmar border um, and then some of the COVID-19 stuff that I've been doing more recently um, here in my new backyard in Southern California. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the the biology of malaria. You've got some you've got some guys there that that could do that better than me, and I'm assuming that that we all know it's a you know it's a vector-borne um, parasitic disease. Um, what I would like to start off with here, though, is uh, is a map. I, I've borrowed this map from the WHO. Um, this is from this is from 2019-2020. Uh, uh, um, and what this map is showing is the Greater Mekong subregion, so that's mainland Southeast Asia essentially, um, and the the color the color scheme, which I'm a little bit critical of. I'm sorry if you're colorblind; you may not be able to tell the difference between the green and the red. Um, but essentially, the dark red colors are places where you've got more than 50 cases of malaria per thousand people per year. Um, and the lighter colored areas, the green and the lighter colored areas are places where you have really low malaria incidence. So, so say less than one case per thousand people per year. Right. And that's, that's an important marker because that less than one case per thousand people per year is what the WHO um, uses as a relatively arbitrary threshold it, it, for, for, low, for low enough to start thinking about retransitioning your control program towards an elimination program. Um, which means that um, rather than just relying on passive case detection where you have sick people um, who make their way to the hospital or the clinic and get diagnosed and treated, you actually need to move into active case detection. And so I'm kind of showing this pathway to elimination um, because I think you hear lots of talk about eradication, elimination, control. Um, so I think it's nice to just kind of spell out what we're talking about um, with these terms. They actually mean something, um, but sometimes they get thrown around a lot. So if you start on the left-hand side, when we're talking about controlling malaria, um, it's moving from where it's just epidemic outbreaks out of control, um, huge spikes in cases, um, to um, where you've got seasonal malaria, but it's at an acceptably low level, right? So most people who get sick, they can go get diagnosed and treated. Most of them are going to be okay. Um, and, and the WHO defines this kind of under control as a slide positivity rate of less than 5%. So that would be 5% um, or less of the folks who come in with a fever, um, have, a, uh, have a slide down a diagnosis for malaria, um, actually come up with malaria. As you move into that less than one case per thousand per year, which if you go back, I can show the map previously, that's much of Southeast Asia. Um, that's where you start talking about a pre-elimination um, pre stage. And that pre program reorientation means you need to go out and try to find asymptomatic cases. Um, you need to find people who, um, even through passive case detection, maybe aren't actually able to quickly receive diagnosis and treatment. So, so that would be people who live in places where um, you don't have clinics or hospitals that are easy to get to, maybe don't even have them at all. Um, as you move from that though, um, into having zero local cases for three years at a national level, then the WHO will certify you as being malaria free um, and then that requires another program reorientation where you're trying to keep malaria from coming back because presumably you still have people who are traveling um, into malarious countries, malarious regions um, and coming back, you probably still have the mosquitoes in the environment to spread it. And so you have to have something that's really nimble and really able to catch those cases really fast and, and do something about it. Um, and so I moved back to this map and you can see a huge chunk of, of Southeast Asia is already at that pre-elimination stage. And all of the countries in this map are, um, are committed um, to eliminating malaria by the year 2030. Right? And Thailand, that's the country that's labeled number two there, they've done really well. Um, where they have problems is on the borders with countries like Myanmar, so that's country number one, um, or Cambodia, country number four, and then parts of Lao PDR, which is to the north, that's uh, country number three there. And where most of my work has been is on that Thai Myanmar border area. I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but along these areas here where you can see that there are some, some chunks of high uh, incidence malaria. Right? And so, in Karen State, it's a uh, so Karen State has an interesting history. Um, it is this is the location of the longest civil war in recorded history. So there could be other ones that went on for longer, but uh, we don't we don't have uh, written records of it. Um, and essentially, they've been at some 
some form of, uh, of conflict for over half a century. Um, and it's, you've got different, um, different armed groups that are in control of different parts of the, of the state. Um, most of them want to have their own state, their own country, um, and they're fighting uh, against the Myanmar military, um, which has quite the reputation. Um, but sometimes they're also fighting uh, with, uh, across different factions, um, even within the Korean uh, ethnic group. Um, a result of this, you know, over half a century of warfare um, is that the infrastructure is terrible. For a, a lot of places, there are few to no roads. Um, healthcare infrastructure has not been built up. Uh, most places do not have hospitals. If they are hospitals, they're government run, and so local populations don't really want to go there. They don't trust them. Um, you do have uh, a Korean Department of Health and Welfare, but they have almost no funding. So, so people would go to those clinics, but probably wouldn't uh, receive diagnosis or treatment. Um, and, and in all that context, what you have is um, uh, a heterogeneous malaria landscape. So you have some places that don't have much malaria, um, especially closer to the Thai border where people can just run across the border and get diagnosed and treated pretty quickly. Um, but then you have some places, especially um, in active conflict zones, where there's a whole lot of malaria. Um, and uh, this, this is for a variety of reasons, partially environmental, partially socioeconomic, uh, access to healthcare and that sort of thing. Um, and as a backdrop to all of that, um, we've got this uh, increasing anti-malarial resistance problem. And it's, it's, this isn't a new problem. Um, drug resistant and multi-drug resistant forms of malaria have emerged in this part of the world before and have spread throughout the world. Um, uh, chloroquine resistance uh, emerged in this area also in South America, but then subsequently spread into Africa and resulted in humanitarian disasters. So, so there's a real concern. Um, we've got one anti-malarial left that is is highly effective, that's artemisinin and its derivatives. Um, and we're seeing uh, increased resistance to that. And, and by, by increased resistance, I mean, it's not completely failing most of the time yet, but whereas once it would have cleared all the parasites in say three days, now it's taking maybe five or six days. Um, and so people who have been working in this area for a long time and have seen subsequent waves of antimalarials fail um, are quite concerned, I'm quite concerned, um, that if we lose this antimalarial, then we don't have anything else on the back burner for probably the next decade. Um, and so that's a problem. Uh, and, and so we've got relatively low heterogeneous malaria. The drugs still basically work, but we know that we may lose them soon. And so one idea has been to just get rid of falciparum while we still have a chance to do that before uh, drug resistant um, uh, uh, strains emerge and then spread globally. Right. So that kind of led to, um, and this is just a picture of the international border that, that you cross working from Thailand, we're going into Myanmar. Um, you, you move from Thailand into Myanmar mostly because the infrastructure in Myanmar in this area is, is almost non-existent. So it's better to drive up and down the border and just go across the river to, to get into places. Um, but with all of this in mind, there have been some targeted malaria elimination campaigns in different parts of, of Southeast Asia, some of them in Cambodia, in uh, Lao PDR, and for this project in, in Myanmar, in, in current state of Myanmar. And this is specifically focusing on falciparum malaria. Um, there is also a lot of Vivax malaria, uh, but there are complications with Vivax treatment. It's much more difficult to treat um, and it's less deadly. Right. It's still important and I think we should still focus on it, but falciparum is the really deadly one and it's easier to treat. Um, and the focus of these um, targeted malaria elimination campaigns has been uh, essentially two prong. One is um, increasing early diagnosis and treatment. So that is setting up a community clinic so people, as soon as they get a fever, can go get diagnosed and treated. And then the, more, uh, the, the thing that gets more attention is this mass drug administration. Uh, so we call it targeted mass drug administration, and we're doing that with an artemisinin derivative, that's dihydroartemisinin, plus piperiquin, so it's a cocktail because we're worried about uh, antimalarials uh, losing their effectiveness, the evolution of resistance, and then we do it with a small dose of primaquin at the end, and the primaquin kills the sexual stage so that transmission doesn't go on. And to start off with, so, so MDA, MDA has been controversial um, for use with malaria. Uh, and I, I can talk about that a little bit more at the end if people have questions. Um, but what we wanted to do first was establish an evidence base of whether or not it was safe, whether or not the communities would actually uh, uh, participate in an MDA, and of course, whether or not it would actually get rid of malaria in a community if we did it. 
And so the, the beginning of this work on the Thai Myanmar border um, was in four uh, pilot villages, study villages. Um, and that's what I'm showing on this map here. So you can see SMRU, that's Shokla Malaria Research Unit. That's where I was based for my, uh, my postdoc work. And then just across the border and along the border on the Myanmar side, on the left-hand side here, you've got the four study villages. That's Kenota, Tupanya, Tikoto, and Tauta in the south, about 100 kilometers from, from the northernmost to the southernmost. Um, and what we did was we, we set up um, a, a geographic information system in each of these villages. We went in and did a full census. Um, we went through and gave every individual in the communities an ID number. Um, then we went and mapped all of the households in all of these villages um, and uh, gave each household an ID number. And in that way, you can link the individuals to their households. Then we set up a community-based clinic in each of these uh, communities so that when somebody gets sick, they can go get diagnosed and treated at the community clinic. And then you write down their ID number and you can map it back to the house. And that way you can map out spatial patterns and infections at a sub-village level, right? Um, at the same time, um, we did the, we set up the mass drug administrations and we started in two, uh, in two of the villages at the beginning. Um, and in this mass drug administration, it takes three days and we repeated it over three months. So it's three days, wait a month, three days, wait a month, three days, wait a month. The, the reason behind that is after a three month period of time, you should have no more mosquitoes that are floating around in the community that have um, infectious parasites inside of them. Um, mosquitoes live about a month. Um, um, and, uh, and then at month nine, we switched over and did the other two villages. So all four villages received MDA, but we started in two first. And then around the second year time point, we hit the, uh, we hit the other two villages and followed all of them up over a two year period of time. And so first off, uh, so first off what I want to show, and I think it's worth thinking about is adherence to MDA. And I've got the four villages here in this little box um, labeled. And, and in the box, what I'm showing is the, it's the percentage of the community members that actually participated in each round of MDA. And then the row on the bottom here shows um, the, the, the percentage of folks who participated in at least one round of MDA. And I don't know if, if, if any of you have done this sort of work, it's, it's, really, it's really labor intensive and difficult. It's difficult to get people to take uh, you know, vaccines or medicine, especially if they don't already feel sick. It's always, it's always a challenge. So, so this work is really difficult. Um, and one round essentially is, 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 is will we'll clear parasites, right? So if somebody takes at least one round, that should clear them of parasites. Um, the reason we do the three rounds is because of the mosquitoes and, and because you catch more people, migrants who move in and out of the, the community. Um, but what you can see is, Two of these villages, you got over 90% um, participation, um, but the other two, you only had about 70% participation. Um, and for one of those villages, Tao Ta in particular, um, there's kind of a, a, a long dramatic story. We had two different political groups in the same community and they didn't want to work together and that was very difficult. Um, but, and that, that made things difficult for adherence. Um, and you, you see the effect slightly in the results of the MDA. Um, and these charts, this is a, a, a plot per village, um, uh, the same four villages. And you can see with the green bars, that's where we did MDA. And what you should focus on is the red line here because that's falciparum malaria. We also show Vivax here, but remember that Vivax wasn't the, Vivax elimination wasn't the goal, falciparum elimination was. So you see the MDA within the bars here in the top two. Um, so it's Kenotan, Ta'ota. And you can see that both Vivax and Falciparum drop pretty drastically with MDA. Vivax comes right back. And we expect this because we didn't completely clear it from the body. Um, and Falciparum for Kenata on the top left stays essentially at zero. It's wiggling around just a little bit, but it stays essentially at zero. But Tao Ta, which is one of the communities, that's, that's a, the real problem community where we had about 70% adherence, um, you get a little bit of a rebound in that second year in the rainy season. For the other two communities, there, there are two takeaways, so the ones on the bottom. One is that you can see that falciparum was already going away before we even did MDA um, around the second year time point. Um, and we attribute that to um, the use of the malaria posts, the, the community-based clinics. It was already driving down that uh, falciparum incidence. Um, and then after we do the MDA, it's essentially staying at zero afterwards. Um, so the top right one, again, we had problems with that in the second year. Um, Actually, I did, I did a, a paper on that, if you, if you have interest in that. And we eventually re-MDA'd that and, and the communities on the outskirts of it and, and did eventually bring down the falciparum incidents to zero there as well. Um, but overarching, what we, what we took away from this was a, a couple of things. Um, 
One is uh, we didn't see any adverse events to the anti-malarials themselves, or, or not, not any serious adverse events. Um, we did learn a lot about the needs for community engagement and difficulties that, that you can have um, with adherence. Um, and ultimately, if you can get enough community adherence, then it does, it, it works. It seems to work. It'll bring it down at least, at least within that two year time period, right? Um, and so from that, we thought, well, well, this works for getting rid of malaria in a targeted setting. Um, but these were four villages and they're surrounded by lots of other malarious villages. So what can we do on a big scale? Can we take this and scale it up in a big way so it's actually operational so that we can actually start talking about big, big geographic units and getting rid of malaria? And that's, that's essentially where, really where my postdoc started on this um, with the, the Malaria Elimination Task Force that was set up in April of 2014. I was actually there a little bit earlier than that, but this was this was this was why uh, uh, the, the head of SMRU recruited me there, um, and it targeted four different townships of Karen State, also spelled Cayenne State. Um, so you can see those in the map here. You've got Papoon, Lengbue, Miawadi, and Kakarate. And I've also plotted the four pilot villages from the previous study, so you can see them in the little black triangles there just for a, um, a scale perspective. So we were moving from four villages where we did a really detailed study on MDA and then trying to scale this up to a really big area. Um, and this requires, uh, as I alluded to, partnerships with a lot of diverse actors in the group. So there's eight different community-based organizations. Um, some of them are actually armed groups that are fighting against the government. Some of them are uh, mil uh, militias that are hired by the government. Um, some of them don't like each other very well. Um, it requires a lot of uh, complex uh, politics to get things going in this area. Um, and the essential operational design here was um, first to set up a geographic information system. So that was, that was my, my big job of this. Um, and that required mapping out the villages and hamlets in Korean state. Um, so it's about 18,000 square kilometers, um, mapped over 14,000 villages there. And by, by mapping, I don't mean every house and every village had a GPS point, but each village had a, a GPS point and uh, filled out survey forms. So the names of the village, uh, oftentimes they have multiple names, the population size, whether or not there's a clinic there and that sort of thing. And this was, this was crucial because there hasn't been a census or definitely a geographic survey done in this area since it was a, a British colony. Right? So, so since, since World War II um, and then afterwards they've gained independence, um, the Korean people have not allowed the government to come in and take a census. There, there's a lot of animosity between them. So, so this was really the first time to go in and actually map this area out right? since, since, uh, since pre-World War II. Um, and after that, so after we have the geographic information set up, um, then we begin to set up malaria posts. It's a community-based clinics. Uh, we opened over 1,200 of these throughout this area. Um, and then we began doing QPCR surveys, so prevalent surveys at villages. Um, at first, we were randomly selecting them because we didn't know exactly what to look for, uh, for looking for high prevalence villages. Um, but then we started noticing spatial patterns in them. Um, and in that if you find one high prevalence village, the other communities that are very close to it are also highly likely to be high prevalence villages. Um, and we use a highly, um, highly sensitive QPCR survey uh, and venous, uh, uh, a venous blood draws to do this. So really sensitive approach. Um, and when we find what we call a hot spot, so that would be a community with greater than 40% malaria prevalence. Um, and then for, of that 20%, at least 20% being falciparum, um, those are villages that we targeted for mass drug administration. Um, and after we did a mass drug administration, the same regimen over three months, um, then 12 months later, we would go back and do a follow-up prevalence survey to see if, if, if it's held, if it's still working, All right? And so, uh, I should focus in a little bit. Uh, I'll get back to the malaria posts. I, again, this is the landscape. When when I first when I first mapped this area out, um, that's the the middle panel here. The black boxes are communities where you had some kind of a, a malaria clinic or or some kind of a post that people could go to to get diagnosed and treated. Um, what we built off of that, though, is what you see in the right-hand panel. So all of the square boxes there are, are places with a malaria post, and the darker colors are the older ones, and the lighter colors are the newest ones. Right? So, so if you focus back on the, the middle panel, those little bitty gray dots, those are communities that didn't have any kind of malaria diagnosis or treatment um, options uh, prior, to this, this, uh, prior to this project. 
Um, and these malaria posts, um, I would liken them to, uh, sometimes the way I explain this is, this is not a gourmet restaurant, this is more like McDonald's. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not a, all you, it's not, a, it's not everything that you want, um, but it's good enough and it's easy to repeat. It's really simple and you can repeat it everywhere. And that's what made the scale up possible, right? So a malaria post, it's, it's staffed and trained by a paid community member. So this is somebody from the community. Um, it's stocked with rapid diagnostic tests that are super easy to use. You can train almost anybody to use them. Um, and then uh, we teach them how to use and how to administer anti-malarials if they come back with a positive test. And then they send us weekly data uh, back to headquarters at SMRU. So each week um, we get we get a count of the number of people who came in with a fever or, or symptoms um, and got tested and the results of those tests. Right? So weekly data from all 1,200 of these. Um, and the malaria post, the kind of the theoretical back, it, it's a really simple idea, but the, 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 the theoretical um, usefulness of it has to do with the, the, the development of gametocytes in falciparum. Um, so in a stereotypical infection, it takes time to even develop a sexual stage that can transmit the disease. Oftentimes you find it, uh, oftentimes you'll find people with parasites in their blood and they don't even have, or they don't even have detectable levels of the sexual stage. Um, and so what that means is if you can get people as soon as they have a fever to go get diagnosed and treated really quickly, especially with a, a drug that includes, um, that, that targets that sexual stage, then you really, that's the gametocytes, you really cut down on transmission just by that alone. Just by getting people to really quickly go get diagnosed and treated, it should cut down transmission of falciparum malaria. Um, and that's, that's, that's the basis of these malaria posts. That's, that's why we're trying to set those up. And um, you can see the, these are the rapid diagnostic tests on the right-hand side. These are interesting because they're all mixed infections, actually. So you can see they have, they're, they're positive for falciparum. They've got the control bar in there. They also have that little pan thing in the middle that means there's likely another, uh, uh, an, another um, uh, species of malaria parasite in those people. Um, and so our basic findings from this, this big scale-up project, um, which is still ongoing, um, is that through a combination of early diagnosis and treatment, so that's the malaria post, and targeted mass drug administration, we really saw a, a drastic reduction in falciparum malaria incidence and, and, in, and in places where we uh, did follow-up surveys in prevalence as well. Um, so th this plot shows um, essentially what happens in a hotspot village with regard to incidence. So that's the incidence of, of symptomatic disease um, before on the left-hand side, and you've got the green bars for mass drug administration in the middle again, and then after, uh, and then after MDA, right? So you can see that it just, it's, it's, a, it's a scale change. It doesn't make it completely go to zero, um, but pretty close. Uh, and, and it brings it down really quickly. With regard to the entire area, what I'm showing here is, um, you can see the kind of light gray colors in the background. These are the number of malaria posts that are reporting with uh, the y-axis on the right-hand side of the screen. All right, so you can see we got up to over 1,200 and essentially kept that a little bit of troubles recently, probably COVID related. Um, and then the two lines focus on the red one again. The red one is falciparum malaria and the green one is, is Vivax malaria. And our project here is focused specifically on falciparum. And what you can see is at the beginning, it was relatively high incidence. So you're getting up around eight, eight, nine cases per thousand people um, per month, right? Um, and then over the duration, as we've opened up more malaria posts and had those malaria posts in place, the red line is just about flatlined. It's not completely gone, but it's getting close. And there's a lot of heterogeneity in this as well, right? So, so it's good to focus on the different, the different townships, even at village level too. Um, what you can see though, is at the beginning, almost all of the falciparum malaria was actually in this northernmost township. That's, that's Papoon Township, right? So you had a lot of falciparum there. Um, and you can see, interestingly, um, if, Ian's in, if Ian's in the audience there, you can see where Vivax and falciparum kind of cross and Vivax actually goes up a little bit, that green line in the top, in the top plot for Papoon. Um, but in, in Hlangbwe and uh, Kakarake and in Miyawati, there's almost no falciparum left at all. Right? You still have a little bit in that northernmost area um, but it's, it's, it's getting quite low. And you can also look at this on a map. So, so um, the red dots here indicate places where any falciparum has been re, re, uh, uh, reported in that year. And the green dots are places where no falciparum malaria was reported in that year. Um, you can also see the, the kind of evolution of the project. So we began in 2014, we couldn't set up all 1200 posts all at once, it took a lot of work. Um, so we started relatively small and moved out 
sort of a contagious pattern. Um, and over time, there are fewer and fewer villages that are reporting any falciparum malaria at all. All right, so, so my overarching conclusions from this project, which is still ongoing, we're still working towards this, um, malaria posts just by themselves have a drastic effect on falciparum incidence, right? So most of those villages that are now reporting almost no falciparum malaria did not receive MDA, right? Um, it's the malaria post by itself, if it's really functioning well, can be quite powerful. MDA though can be quite useful, especially in situations where the malaria post isn't working all that well, right? So if you have a lot of asymptomatic uh, uh, infections in a community, those are folks who they don't feel sick, so they're not gonna go get diagnosed and treated, right? And if you have a lot of those, they, they could, they're, they're likely still contributing to transmission. Um, and so you have to do something about that or the malaria post is not gonna do it by itself. MDA could be a powerful tool for doing that. Um, and just a side note, malaria posts are relatively easy to set up, MDAs are not, right? So there is, I mean, there's a lot of work, training, follow-ups and everything that goes on with malaria posts. MDAs are a completely different beast. That's a, that's a very difficult thing to do. Right. And this, this is of course, so the mapping, this is a huge team project. So obviously I didn't do this by myself. Even the mapping, uh, I, had, I had assistance help moving me out with that. I worked with our community engagement team at, uh, at SMRU um, and lots of different community members. And, and usually what I would be doing is going into, uh, I'd, I'd go into a community, I'd work with local community leaders, recruit 30 or 40 local folks, teach them to use a GPS device and to fill out forms and that sort of thing and send them out in the community. Um, and so there's it's just a huge team effort to do this. And I'll, I'll have some credits at the very end of this talk to, to thank some of the folks that um, made this project possible. Um, but now I will shift, let me look at my time real quick. Yeah, I will shift into um, a little bit of tuberculosis. I'm really, I'm a malariologist. I, I know I know vector-borne infectious diseases, especially malaria, better than other bugs. Um, but I began to grow an interest uh, with tuberculosis um, partially because we had less and less malaria to study, but I still wanted to work on the Thai Myanmar border. And also because the, the institute that I was working at there, the field station um, was starting to work on TB as well. Um, and I guess as, as a backup to this, um, so this, the field station that I was based at, it's been, it's been there on the border for I think 35 years or more now. Um, they've, they've had antenatal clinics um, since 1986. Um, and for a little over 20 years, they've had migrant clinics that have been set up on the border. Um, and those, those clinics, they, they serve populations, pe people who are coming across the border because they don't have, e either because they're already coming to Thailand for work, for like agricultural work and that sort of thing, or just because they, they don't really have um, healthcare options in Korean state and Myanmar. And so they cross the border into Thailand to, to seek healthcare services. Um, and so the, these clinics were set up um, to, to serve that population. And over time, we started noticing uh, increasingly more and more TB cases. Um, and so in 2009, SMRU set up uh, TB diagnosis and treatment capabilities. In fact, set up uh, clinics on, uh, uh, sister clinics on both sides of the border um, to treat uh, migrants who have tuberculosis. Um, and this is, this is an image from one of those, uh, uh, one of those clinics. Um, and one, one little project that I had there before I left was we, we interviewed um, uh, patients who had multi-drug resistant tuberculosis um, with regard to where they have lived uh, uh, over, the last, over the last several years, over the likely duration of their um, infection. Um, and one thing that we found is that uh, these folks were moving all over the place. Um, so in this map, um, I'm again showing uh, Southeast Asia, you got Thailand and Myanmar. Um, the, blue, the blue square is a point of origin. So that's the place where the patient was from. The gray line that moves out from that shows the migration history of that person, and the orange dot is a is a duration of stay um, at a at a migration place of origin. So that's that's a place where that migrant has gone to and lived. And the bigger dots indicate that person was there for a longer period of time. Right? And the essential takeaway from this is is that these folks with MDRTB were moving all over the place, um, and were not. First off, we're not able to receive treatment or diagnosis even much of the time, um, but certainly moving around this much weren't able to complete a full duration of treatment, which can take like two years, right? And so this kind of finding just really heightens the need um, for some kind of a system that could address the needs of migrants with, with TB and uh, especially with multi-drug resistant TB um, uh, because seeking 
being diagnosed in the first place uh, can be difficult for folks who are undocumented or um, living in uh, precarious circumstances. Um, but then if you are diagnosed with MDR-TB, well, that's, that's very, that's difficult for someone who moves around quite a bit because you need to receive um, a treatment regimen for, for almost two years, right? Um, and so that was the idea behind SMRU's uh, uh, TB clinics, the sister clinics that I previously mentioned. Um, this is one picture of the one on the Thai side of the border. Um, and essentially what they've done is they've set up a place where people can live, right? So um, sometimes they can have family members, depending on their health status, come live with them. Um, they set up farms uh, uh, and, and different activities for folks who are living there um, so that they're not just sitting in the rooms all the time. Um, and this is, this is essentially a place for people to to, uh, to receive treatment um, over the duration over, over the duration that they need to have treatment, right? which is a difficult thing. Um, and, uh, and there's not just this population with TB. Here I'm showing a map of, uh, of a refugee camp. This is Mayla camp. Um, it's just a little bit north of that, uh, of that TB clinic. Um, and this camp has been there now for also like 30 years. Um, so you have multiple generations of folks who've just grown up in this, in this camp. Um, at its height, probably had about over over 50,000 people, and I believe today is probably more like 35,000 people. But proper population census is difficult. I'm gonna kind of zoom in on this little square so you can see how dense it is. So in some ways, this looks like a, a Korean village. The houses are essentially the same, but it's really densely populated. Like it's a huge population, um, and and uh, people are living really really close to each other. Um, and we knew that there was there were TB. Um, problems in the camp. There were some old uh, Doctors Without Borders, uh, MSF um, surveys that had been done in years past. Um, but we wanted to go in and kind of get a, a true estimate of what the, the actual prevalence of TB was. Um, and so in order to do that, we did a, a big prevalence survey. Um, so you can see that the camp is, set, is split off into different sections and zones. Um, and we conducted surveys in all of the sections, all 22 sections. Um, essentially, any camp dweller above age nine could participate in the study. And we were able to successfully recruit um, over 18,000 people, so 18,428 camp dwellers. Um, they, they were first interviewed, asked about symptoms, history of living in the camp, age, uh, general demographics, and that sort of thing. Out of these, uh, almost uh, 2,500 of them were suspected to have TB, either because um, they reported uh, symptoms or they had a chest x-ray that was abnormal. Um, and out of those folks, 155 um, were ultimately confirmed to have TB. And confirmation was done by uh, using sputum samples and normal uh, culture methods and also gene expert. Um, and so, so from this survey, um, the, the, the overarching goal, uh, so using uh, uh, um, inverse uh, probability weighting and, and uh, um, uh, some other statistical techniques, um, I've estimated a point estimate for the total camp prevalence at about 800 per 100,000 people. Um, and for you TV folks out there, you'll know that's, that's, that's relatively high. Um, and also interestingly, there was a lot of uh, heterogeneity by zones, so he uh, spatial heterogeneity in, in the prevalence. Um, so the, the plot on the top here, these bar charts, um, you can see there's a, a, a dark red line with confidence intervals around it. That's the overarching camp prevalence, about 800 per 100,000 people. Um, and the, the sections are labeled along the x-axis and they correspond to the sections that you see in the camp map behind you there. Um, except that the camp map starts with A at the very bottom, kind of on your right-hand side and moves up to C. What you can see is that there seems to be some, a little bit of clustering even. So A, A4 and A5 down at the very bottom here have uh, some of the highest prevalences in the camp. Um, C1, C1, uh, different sections within C1 back here at the back of the camp also have uh, pretty high prevalences as well. Much, much higher, almost twice as much as the overall camp, camp prevalence. Um, and there's some, hopefully we'll have this paper out this coming year. Um, there's some other interesting findings too. Uh, it really um, uh, uh, correlated strongly with age of camp dwellers as well. Um, and I'm trying to tease out why that might be. Um, I spoke with a couple of you about this earlier today. It's not clear to me whether or not age was actually a risk factor or if this is just um, people who uh, picked up an infection when they were young and it's re-emerging now, or if uh, these folks who are older, they've actually also, they also have, tend to have lived in this camp environment for you know, 20 years or more now. Um, and so if the, if the camp itself is an environmental exposure, then they've had more of it than, than other folks too, all right? Um, and so that's kind of where we are with that. I hope this paper will come out in the next year. Um, and I think I will finish on um, some, what's been taking up a lot of my time here lately, 
although I, uh, I, I really love talking about malaria and, and other stuff too. Um, but I've been doing, I've gotten involved with some COVID-19 work in Orange County um, because my, the, the methods I use of mapping out infectious diseases and thinking about the social and demographic factors that lead people to have higher risk of infection and that sort of stuff, it also applies here. Um, and so I've been working, uh, I've got several different projects going. I did a big contact tracing training over the summer. We did some big seroprevalence surveys, one, one in the summer and then one just in December. Um, but I've also been working with the Orange County Healthcare Agency um, to, to kind of try to make sense of the, of, uh, of the data that, that's pouring in. Um, so they, they get all of the, all the reported test results from COVID-19 tests go back to the Orange County Healthcare Agency. Um, and so I can map the, the case incidents at the zip code level out over time. And in this map, that's what I'm showing. So on the top, the top two rows, this is case incidents, so reported cases per 100,000 people per week and then by March, April, May, June, July. Um, and the darker colors indicate higher incidence and the, the yellow color in indicates uh, zero to five cases per 100,000, so almost no cases. And perhaps the interesting story, one of the interesting stories that's come out of this is that you can see, if you look at March on the very top left there, um, at the very beginning, the darkest places were along the coastal areas. Um, and probably most of you don't know Orange County geography, but that's, that's Laguna Beach, Newport Beach, uh, those are those are wealthy affluent areas, um, so that's that, that's where that, some some of the wealthiest zip codes in, in the nation, probably the world, um, and um, so those those are the people who were first showing reported cases at the beginning of the outbreak, the local outbreak in Orange County. You can see though that it quickly shifted, and by May we start having a hot spot growing in that north central spot, and it just gets bigger and bigger. Um, and it, it kind of dips down. I'm still mapping this out. Um, but in December, again, we had a, a, had a peak that was even higher than what we experienced back in June and July. And it's in that exact same spot. Uh, the panels on the bottom are the results of some um, spatial statistics that I've used. Um, and essentially, um, places that are red indicate where there's a statistically significant hot spot of cases being reported. Um, and it's from the same data as the top. And it just shows you the same thing. You can see the red spots, the hot spots were along that coastal area in March, and then it shifted up to that north central area where it's persisted over time. So. One interesting thing about this, so that, that, that hot spot in the north central area, that's, that's Santa Ana. So that's a place with uh, low socioeconomic, um, uh, with, with low, uh, a low socioeconomic area. You have a huge Latino population there, um, a lot of uh, essential workers uh, living in this area. It's really population dense. Um, so there's lots of reasons why uh, it's not that surprising that it would be centered there, but a little bit surprising that you would see it in those really affluent areas at the beginning. Um, and if you look at actual testing intensity, this partially explains what happened. Um, so I'll just focus on the bottom two rows. Um, this, this is showing the number of tests being reported per 100,000 people per week for the same time period. And you can see from March in the, in the, the second to bottom row there that there was a, a hot spot of testing um, all along that, that coast and in the southern part of the, the county at the beginning, right? That, overlaps relatively well with, with the hotspots of ca reported cases at the beginning. Um, and, then, and then it shifts, the hotspot of testing shifts up into that, that north and north central area after that, kind of following where the case incidence is in the previous maps. Um, and so one of the takeaways from this is that, um, well, first off, those folks from affluent uh, communities, they may have been traveling, you know, maybe perhaps they were traveling to, to Europe uh, 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 or to China around that same time, March, when, when things were going really bad. Um, but also, uh, there's something about access to diagnosis and treatment going on here, too. I was, I was a bit shocked to be living in a pretty wealthy part of the world and to be experiencing the same type of global health problems that you would see in, in Myanmar. It's really hard for people to even get a diagnosis. Back in March, I had neighbors in my community of, we're all academics, we're all relatively well off. Um, and most of us couldn't receive a test at that time. It was hard to get a test for, for folks. Um, but I think if you are, if you are more fluent, if you're a millionaire, then perhaps you have a different, uh, a different relationship with uh, your medical providers than, than if you're not. Um, and that, that also partially explains probably why we saw that cluster in the wealthier areas at the beginning, which then shifted and has persisted in, in uh, lower socioeconomic areas since then. Um, yeah, and so this, this, uh, uh, this is a preprint out. There's a lot more analyses going on, uh, also tying this in with serial prevalence surveys and that sort of stuff, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna spend an hour talking about this. Um, 
but there, there is a preprint. So if you'll sh shoot me an email or, or something, I can, I can send you the link to that. Um, and with that, uh, I have a lot of people that I should thank for the elimination campaign. So that was all done while I was based at Shokul Malaria Research Unit, which is a, it's a field station of the Mahidon Oxford Tropical Research Network. Um, it's, a, it's a field station of the Mahidon Oxford Research Unit, which is also a part of the Oxford Tropical Network. Um, and my postdoc advisor was Francois Nostin. That's, uh, that's the guy that you see over here on the right-hand side. Um, and a, a younger picture of him. He's been on the border now for, oh, for it must be, close to, must be close to 40 years now. Um, and now, um, so I've moved on, several of the others have moved on from the project, but Jade Ray is a PhD student that is there. Um, uh, doing all the number crunching and some of the map making now. Um, I, I need to thank Nick White and Nick Day and Arjen Dondorp and Lawrence von Sideline, who are all um, heavily involved in this elimination project and also ones going on in Cambodia and Vietnam and, and Laos. Um, communities in Eastern Korean state that, that uh, worked with me and worked with us and allowed us to, to do this project. Um, and hopefully um, this, these malaria posts will become their, their healthcare system. Hopefully we'll expand it from just a, a vertical system to something that can uh, you know, help out with uh, uh, maternal and child health, TB is a little bit of a challenge. It's hard to diagnose and treat, but hopefully they'll expand. Um, also, uh, photos from Supak Nosen, Jordi uh, Landier, and Lada, um, and, and of course, all of the local community-based organizations. Um, and then for the TB, uh, Michelle Domas, uh, Win Papa, and Cynthia, um, uh, uh, the doctors working there, uh, patients and community members that spoke with us and explained the, their troubles and, and the situation. And then finally, for the, the, the OC COVID stuff, that's uh, Orange County Healthcare Agency. That's been my, my major collaborator for that. Um, and the elimination campaign, the malaria elimination campaign was all funded by the Global Fund and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so the Gates Foundation, they like high tech stuff. Um, so that was funding the GIS, my mapping, the MDAs. The Global Fund is less about that sort of thing, but uh, they, they funded the malaria post essentially. So that's what came together to make this happen. Um, and with that, um, I'll open up to, to questions. I'll stop blabbering on and, uh, and try to answer any questions that anybody has. Um, and this is a, so this is a picture. You can see me stuck up in the right-hand side. So this is from one of my mapping trainings where I'm teaching people to use GPS devices to go map out their own communities. And this particular area, you, you it's a difficult trip across the Salwen River and then about a, a almost a 20 kilometer hike into the place. And if it's rainy like this, you can't, there, there's no year round roads anyways, motorbikes work in the dry season, but when it's like this, you'll fall right off the mountain. Um, I fell off a mountain once. Uh, uh, and if you get in there and stuck in really bad rainy season, then you're just through there for a while. Um, but a fun place, but also challenging to do work. Right? Um, so yeah, so any questions, I'm happy to answer. I see one from uh, from Larry saying, based on your mapping strategies, can you develop predictive modeling for where bugs will go next to get ahead of the curve? We're doing a little bit. We're trying this a little bit, right? So, so, uh, so Tim Tim Anderson has uh, um, a lot of samples from these different ones. So geo reference samples. So one thing that that we've been really interested in is trying to assess how much uh, parasite movement there is across these landscapes, um, and part of this. Part of this gets at, well, of course, it's, a lot of this is about human movement. Um, and in some of the places where you have the highest malaria burden, there's actually less, uh, it's less possible to move around a lot. So this kind of area where, where the picture is here, um, it's, there's, not, there, there's almost no vehicles moving is by walking and in the rainy season, it's really hard. Um, and so that, that I think limits the movement a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, essentially, so, so lots of geospatial work going on with that, trying to assess how parasites move across the landscape and that sort of thing, which um, would help us get ahead of the curve, but also should help uh, define um, intervention scales, the spatial scales of interventions, for example. Like perhaps, perhaps an MDA shouldn't be targeting a single village, but maybe groups of villages, as an example. Does anyone have any further questions? Oh, I see uh, one just came through. I see from an anonymous attendee, what advice do you have for young scientists interested in international health disparity and in field research? Ah. So 
Um, pick up skills that pick, find things that you're passionate about. If you can be passionate about something that uh, that other people maybe don't like to do, or it's a skill set that'll make you unique. So for me, that was like GIS, spatial analysis, that sort of statistics. Um, uh, that makes you valuable. And then to be a good collaborator, be somebody that people like to work with. Right? So you can, you can be smart, but be somebody that people don't want to work with, and that'll cut off lots of opportunities. Um, what's, what's been really successful for me is I like analyzing data. I don't mind working in difficult situations. I kind of like an adventure. Um, and, uh, and I write. I read and I write a, I, I write a lot. Um, and I feel like that has um, gotten me into lots of different collaborations that have been really fruitful. And then it just kind of snowballs off of that. Um, just it builds on it builds off of that over time and you just you develop local ties um, with communities and that sort of thing and uh, um, and and it just goes from there essentially um, from Shelley uh, are participants more willing to engage with researchers and medical staff after having been in your study um one thing I probably didn't stress enough I, I don't know if they're Maybe, maybe the answer was BS. Um, probably what I should have stressed even more is uh, most of the staff at the research unit there are actually ethnic Korean folks. So there's there's a, a little core of expats, if you would, but most of the people working there are actually, they're locals. Um, some of them are highly trained. Some of them have been working with, uh, you know, research physicians for the last 20 years. Um, and so when you're working with them and you're going into communities, it's very different than if I were just to show up by myself. Right, it's those the people you're going there with. They have aunts and uncles and cousins in those communities already. They speak the same language. They look the same. Um, that makes things very different than if I were to just show up from the U.S. and wander into one of these villages. Probably that wouldn't work at all. Right. So, so I, I think probably through our community engagement efforts, um, it it has uh, an enhanced improvement. But at the get-go, people people really recognized that they had a malaria problem. They already knew they already knew what Shokul Malaria Research Unit was. Some of the folks that were working with us or, or working for SMRU, they are Korean, and so that just kind of facilitates this sort of thing, really. So Daniel. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I don't have access to the Q&A, but uh, uh, anyway, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, from a point of view of drug resistance, yes. using okay. mass drug administration seems like putting kerosene on a fire. Uh, <laughs> I wonder if you can comment on, on, on what you see. That's a good, that's a that, that is an excellent question, um, and it gets back at the, uh, the the controversial nature of MDA for for malaria in particular. Um, so I, I believe back in the 1960s, somebody came up with the bright idea to put chloroquine, which is a, a cheap and at that time a effective anti-malarial, um, in table salt, and they just kind of distributed this chloroquine and table salt across Southeast Asia, um, and you know not surprisingly, uh, drug resistance to chloroquine emerged and spread. Um, I believe that's the real reason people are super worried about MDA for, they, they seem more worried about it for malaria than for other bugs. Um, but so, so I guess what I would say in general though, MDA in the way that we do it, which is very different than throwing some, some anti-malarials in salt and just giving it out to everyone um, in a really targeted way with directly observed treatment and, and uh, with di directly observed uh, administration and that sort of stuff. Um, I believe it's very different in that um, one of the big differences is that most of the people that we're getting with MDA, there are people who are asymptomatic and have really low parasitemia. Um, and so the way I think about this is that the folks that I, that I worry more about driving resistance or people who are hyperparasitemic who are going to a hospital or a clinic and then receiving anti-malarials. You've got more individual parasites coming into contact with anti-malarials in those folks than you actually do in, a, in one of those folks than you would in a typical Korean village um, where you're dosing the entire village, but the people who have it have really low parasitemia. Um, and so for me personally, yeah, yes, I do worry about it. We're monitoring it. That's part of the work we're doing with him, of course. Um, but I worry more about your standard run of the mill um, diagnosis and treatment driving resistance than I do MDA done in the way that we've done MDA. So perhaps I can ask a follow-up question then. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, of course. Uh, 
Yeah, so you did your big treatment program in four big townships. Yes. Uh, but for a cynical person looking at it, uh, you didn't have any control region. You're right. Uh, could, it, could it be that malaria disappeared for reasons completely unconnected with all your hard work? It's possible. Um, but I don't think, I think unlikely, but possible. Um, so some of the areas, some of the sub, more Southern areas, especially the, the, central, the central area, um, it started off with low incidence in the beginning. Um, that's a very different environment. You know, it's the agricultural landscapes, not a lot of forests left. Um, you have some highways there. Uh, um, so that one, I'm less sure about. The, up in Papoon in that Northern township, um, actually where this picture is taken, uh, there's not a whole lot of other possibilities for what would have done it, um, uh, to be honest. So, so in this area in particular, I'm pretty confident that it's the, it's the malaria post and, and also MDA, um, but it's, it's mostly the malaria post because there's not a whole lot of, unless it just went away by itself, I don't know what else would have done it. There's not a lot of other options for these folks. But for some of the other areas, it's it's more difficult. There's a lot of deforestation going on and all sorts of other things that are harder to harder to account for. But you're right. Yeah. So so particularly, I wondered about deforestation, in that we know these are forest biting mosquitoes. So deforestation could be very effective control. Yes. <laughs> yes. So yeah, I mean, if you so, <laughs> Ian and I, Ian and I were talking about this earlier. So if you cut down the forest and you know, there's not going to be a lot of malaria left in, in Southeast Asia. Um, but really, I'm trying to go back to a map. Yeah, here we go. So really, that that northernmost area, Papoon, that area, there's there's almost no deforestation. The deforestation is relatively minimal in that area because it's still a, they call it a gray zone, um, or a big chunk of it is still a gray zone. So it's an area where one brigade of one armed Korean group is in control and has still not signed on to the peace treaties with the Myanmar government. And so what that means is that it's been more difficult for people to come in and build roads and cell phone towers and cut the forest down essentially. Um, and so in some ways you could think of that as kind of a, con <laughs> it, 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 keeps, it keeps development from happening. But in the other ones like Langbue, Langbue is developing fast. Miyawati is developing fast. Um, so, so those areas, it's, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on simultaneously. But Papoon is still pretty well undeveloped. So I think there's another Q and A. Oh. <clears throat> ah, yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so this is from an anonymous attendee. How widespread is the use of bed nets and pesticides for vector control in the study area? And did you notice an increase in malaria eradication success in areas with high pesticide use compared to low or no pesticide use? So, um, so first, um, eradication. So, so I'll, I'll be a little bit uh, picky about terms. So, uh, we're doing an elimination campaign. Elimination is you eliminate from a defined area. Eradication would technically be that you've eliminated from all areas. So the whole globe, there's, there's none left. Um, so, so really we're doing elimination, not eradication here with a goal, of course, for uh, eradication, but whether that will happen, I don't know. Um, so the widespread use of bed nets. Um, so we distribute lots of bed nets. There's lots of other, there's huge bed net campaigns. Um, it's a little tricky in this area because the mosquitoes aren't, they don't behave as well as they do in other places. So they don't, they, they tend to not bite indoors and they tend to bite at dusk and dawn. And bed nets work best when you're sleeping under them, right? Um, and so if you have mosquitoes that are biting people outdoors and at, at the times when, you know, farmers, a hardworking farmer is gonna wake up early and maybe even after a long day of work is gonna sit out on his porch and, and drink some rice liquor or something for a period of time. So for those, that situation, for this ecological context, um, bed nets have, I wouldn't say they're not useful, but they have limited use in comparison to other places. Um, the pesticides thing, I have not, I don't know that anybody, I have not really looked at that. Um, for this Northern area, there's limited pesticide use just because of access to things. Um, and Langbue and Miyawati, there is a lot of pesticide use and it's completely unregulated. People can just do whatever they want. Um, uh, so I don't know what the association would be there, um, but it's, it's an interesting question. There is recently a paper from the uh, from the same area where they were doing outdoor residual spraying 
Uh, and honestly, I have not read enough about it to to uh, comment on that. But I do believe they were finding some um, some strong effects on uh, knocking down incidents if you spray around a village too. Um, yeah. So I, ho I hope that's I hope that's at least partially answered your question. I believe that's all the questions we have, Daniel, unless Tim, you have something else to, to add? Yeah, sure, maybe I can, we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, so final question I wanted to ask is, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about setting up 1400 malaria posts, uh, but still, I mean, the, this is a very mountainous sort of uh, difficult to get to area. Mm -hmm. Did you visit each one of these places or did you have a helicopter or, I mean, how no. uh, can you do oh. that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've not been to every single community in Kern State, no. Um, I've been to a lot, but not, not all of them. Let's see if I can. Uh, and um, so essentially what I would do is I would go into each there, there tends to be someone who's kind of in control of areas or someone who's politically important in different areas. Uh, so here you can see, right, so here you can see another GPS training. I would go in, I would find you know, like village, village head, uh, village leaders, um, people who are important locally for, for political reasons or with healthcare or whatever. Um, and I would work through them to recruit folks who live in, the, in that area and so, so it would just be about me getting to that place, which isn't all of the communities, but it's somewhere kind of central. Um, and so sometimes, sometimes that's as easy as uh, going across a river and there's a community right there and we can do everything there. Sometimes it means uh, uh, getting in a boat for four hours and then getting out and walking on land for, for a whole day or, or, or more. Um, and, then, and then essentially camping out for a while to do it. Um, but it, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't me going to um, every single community. It was working through local folks, um, and honestly, these guys I mean they're they're in a lot better shape than I'm in, and they uh, they're used to trekking these these mountains and everything. Um, you can see one kind of uh, invention. I guess other people do this too. I've not seen this before, but you can see the motorbike. They've wrapped a bike chain around it so that it'll grip into the mud so they can go over the mountains. Um, and in and, and the rainy season. Um, I've seen people fall off of the mountains. I fell off a mountain once too. Um, well, it wasn't pleasant, um, <laughs> uh, but it's a, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult but beautiful landscape, but it's, it's working with folks who are from there um, because if, you know, there's, there's a lot of communities that if I, I, I couldn't just show up there by myself, uh, that, that wouldn't be good. It's, it's better to have them doing it and, and working through them. Yeah, hope this is interesting and uh, it's been nice chatting with everybody and if you have more questions don't anybody don't hesitate to send me an email.